Well, the talk today or tonight for some of you is on silence and peace, freedom. We tend to think of silence as an absence of sound. Uh, but I'd like to offer a way to explore what we might mean by silence in a different way, which is a silence in how we're relating to how things are happening. So there's a, <clears throat> in some ways you could say, if you pay attention closely to what we call what we normally would refer to as silence. Sometimes if, you're, if things are very quiet, there's actually a sound to the, that. It's kind of crackling and there is a sound with it. But, but what I mean by silence is um, a freedom from suffering. It's a freedom from feeling the need to tinker with what's, what your experience or uh, react or um, try to control it, get rid of, fix, want, just any way that we're not just being vulnerable and being with our experience. Not even trying to let anything go, just being with. And, and that it includes, the silence includes many things it, because there needs to be a genuine interest in what's happening. It can't be fake. We can't, this isn't, a, it's not a silence you can fake. It's something you can't make happen. It's something you have to fall into. It's like we, we settle into this sometimes. And it's impermanent. And so why is it impermanent? Well, until we're fully enlightened, there's, uh, as we go through our lives, but on retreat we see it more clearly, uh, I like to call how the practice unfolds a process of purity and purification. And we tend to like it when purity is happening, and we tend to not like it when purification is happening. So, for example, there are, and there are levels of purity, but you could say that purity is what we often will call good practice. It's like we, we feel like um, we're getting enough feedback that, that things are kind of going our way. And if you look closely at what might be happening at that time, well, actually a genuine kindness is happening or a genuine mindfulness is happening, a genuine um, equanimity, acceptance is happening. Uh, if resistance is happening and we accept that and we're interested in the resistance, that's purity. So you, you can see that um, everything is about our relationship with what's happening. Vipassana and freedom is about not what the experience is, but how the awareness is relating to what's happening. And in, in this, um, in life, but in the style of practice, you see more clearly that when purity happens, and in any form, it doesn't have to be super strong, but it, there's enough of the factors of awakening happening. It might be some calm, uh, might be a little concentration, joyful interest, uh, but enough that um, this is like bathing, bathing our body, heart, mind in warm, soapy water. And of course, we want the bath. We practice for the bath. Um, and it actually feels good. It, you know, we, the, um, Jesse and Steve have mentioned that we can feel really good about, about our practice, even if the most painful experience is happening, if the awareness is with it and open and accepting, interested, right? So that, that this warm, soapy water, the bath is meant to um, not only give us an experience of freedom and silence, but it's also meant to um, 
get the dirt out. So we take the bath for the bath itself, but also we um, want, not all, I mean, we don't always like it, but we actually want to see aversion. We want to see attachment. We want to see doubt. We want to see uh, delusion, or we can't get free. And we'll be more and more afraid of those things and more um, and oppressed by them. We get less oppressed by getting a relationship with aversion. So, for example, when aversion comes up and we think, oh, God, I'll never get rid of that, that, that is not what I mean by silence. But silence is when aversion comes up and it's like a really deep silence would be no, pro no resistance to it whatsoever, no problem, not taking it personally, no sense that it shouldn't be there. And then often if, you know, this is maybe rare, but there might be even that place of like, oh, great, I really don't have... 100% freedom with aversion. I was hoping it would come up so that I could get more experience with how to be with it. That's silence. There's no static, right? There's nothing in between us and the experience. That absence. It's like when the refrigerator hum goes off. It's like, huh. It tastes different. The experience tastes different. So I would say that a lot of the practice is coming to understand this process of purity, purification, of getting that often, um, even if there's like a few seconds of the purity, that the, the dirt is going to come out. And then if we have more, if we have an hour of it, then of course at some point we're really going to get something like whatever we, we're needing. Whatever we're needing to see to get free is going to come up. And of course it comes up. That's why we practice. But we often forget. Like when we, we and of course when things are, um, effortless or easier or you know we're inspired and um, something kind of clobbers us from nowhere um, usually we'll resist it because we think the purification is bad practice we think if attachment comes up that we shouldn't have attachment or if we think if delusion comes up we shouldn't have delusion or confusion whatever it is we're so judgmental about our experience, our human experience. What if jealousy comes up and you thought, well, I thought I got rid of that five years ago. That's not freedom. What if this knee pain that you thought you got rid of in physical therapy comes up? <laughs> it's like, oh, you know, whatever it is, you know, we just will think, oh, no, it's still happening. It came back rather than, oh, I actually, I've had this happen enough that I actually have a pretty good relationship with this. Maybe I could try being with this. We cannot hear enough that freedom is not getting rid of our humanity. We're not getting rid of our body. We're not getting rid of our thoughts. We're not getting rid of our emotions. We're not making them prettier. We're just learning how to be friends with each one. The, the silent friendship is just making space for what is, making space for life to be how it is. And we don't have to get rid of anything. It'll move by itself if we get out of the way. But it might come back. <laughs> ah, I have visual aids. I have a book called Mirror for the Moon, Saigyo. It's such an old book. I got it at a youth's bookstore. And, um, Many years ago, probably when I was late high school, and um, 
the person who owned it before made all these notes in it. And I love that. I love that I have this like stream of history with this book. Um, so with this poem, clearly the person liked this poem a lot. There's all this writing underneath it and it's really fun. Um, so this is a, a collection of Saigyo's poems from, he lived from 1118 to 1190. Making my way through the whirling rapids of Miyataki River, I have the sense of being washed clean to the base of my heart. The, the retreat is meant to wash us clean to the base of our heart, and, and the water flowing is life. It's just, it's all, it's life. We don't change life in any way to be in retreat. You can see it at home or at a retreat center, seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, touching, thinking, emotions. They're all flowing, flowing, flowing. But how aware are we of them? What's our relationship to them? And when we get to be more protected uh, and have the practice, we're actually getting washed. And just to repeat, we tend to like the bath, we tend to not like the dirt. A lot of you know um, that a teacher named Ajahn Chah, a great teacher from a Thailand, a monastic forest monk, gave an example of um, how to relate to our favorite objects at home, such as your favorite cup that you drink, tea, tea coffee, herbal tea, whatever, water. But he, it, he held up his favorite cup as a teaching and he said I love this cup this is my favorite cup so I take care of it and this is so important it's like I take care of this cup I love this cup my favorite cup but I also relate to it like it's already broken and here is the great teaching of the Buddha of practice. It's like this deep paradox that the logical mind cannot penetrate. It, it's just like, it's like the heart, the depth of the heart penetrates it. And the depth of equanimity, there is no contradiction and paradox whatsoever. And so that you can, in the depth of the heart, we can totally love and totally know it's, that whatever appears will end. You know, so we, we take birth in our body, all beings take birth in our body, and can we care about it? Can we love our body? Because we take responsibility for that, just like the cup, but we already know it's impermanent. It's not gonna make it. And one of the staggering, I think, things about our humanity is that it's really hard for us to accept that we, we ourselves are going to die. You know, it's like no, maybe everybody else, but somehow not me. Like it's amazing. Or maybe some, some being we love. Um, and yet this is the path. Or we'll, we'll kind of see people who will maybe accept that they're going to die, but then they can't love, love. So here we have this love and wisdom as being the path. And I really feel that when we're home and we're practicing, we get to see <laughs> that the, sorry, <coughs> the places in our home that we don't pay attention to that are also sacred. Maybe it's the steps we walk out of a 
door with? Maybe it's a doorknob. Maybe it's a doorknob, a, a little knob on a cabinet or the toilet paper thing that, you know, the toilet paper comes out of. Whatever it is, it's like, wow. When you start practicing in your house, you get a whole different picture of how, where, what is the relationship we have with everything. This is Vipassana. It's not just about relationship to sound. It's relationship to, ah, what's it like to be on the second step coming out of my house? I, I tend to um, find that each self-retreat I do at my home, I, I see a new being that I've never really paid attention to before. And even that feels um, sometimes staggering, but also very humbling. Uh, so this year, um, it was geckos. And... Um, I really have spent many years cleaning up gecko shit. If you, if you live in Hawaii, there is so much gecko crap everywhere. Um, I suppose there are people that maybe remove them from the house, but there's so many. Uh, but I don't really, I've never really given them any attention. And I, I feel like um, suddenly this retreat, it was like, you know, the Buddha saw security everywhere. I saw, I saw geckos everywhere. You know, and it was just, wow. I'm like, wow, I don't know anything about these beings. I've had no interest in them. Um, and there's a, a, the three feral cats. The mother cat uh, sleeps in the garage at night. And um, <clears throat> I have put a night light in the garage for her. And there's a gecko. <laughs> There's a gecko that lives behind the nightlight that um, I don't know when it started, but what has started for me is that when I open the door in the morning, I say good morning to both of them. Like, I'm like, hey, and uh, the, uh, the gecko behind the nightlights, its name is Hobbs for Calvin and Hobbs. Because Hobbes plays games with me, like Hobbes hides, and Hobbes thinks I don't see it. Like behind the nightlight, it see, thinks I don't see it. So I come over and I'm like Hobbes, and it's like, it's like I'm like good morning. And who would have guessed? But it's not just Hobbes. And then the mother cat has noticed that I have a relationship with the gecko, and it's it's, and she's starting to like look and take it in you know she's getting a relationship and uh but it's like there are so many geckos doing so many things and i'm wondering well who had the babies there's lots of babies and like who had them and i don't know and you're like are they male and fe or female or whatever i don't know do they hear me i don't know it's like wow that it's just extraordinary the lack of um interest vipassana is getting a relationship with everything inside and outside with betrayal with rage with calm with compassion with gecko ants cockroaches when i was um teaching one year in, in a monastery in Burma in Chazwa, the annual retreat there. Uh, one year there was a cockroach in the bathroom, a very big cockroach. Uh, and I'm often busy. And I, I actually kept thinking it was going to go away. <laughs> you know, every day that I went <laughs> many times a day, I'd be like, I just, I didn't even really notice there was a version. It was just like a light annoyance. And I'm like, well, certainly it's going to go away. It's going to go away. And it's a three-week retreat. And after about a week, I was kind of going through a kind of lonely couple of days. And I walked into the bathroom and the cockroach looked so happy to see me. And I was like, wow. Again, there was no relationship. And I started to get a relationship with this cockroach that has opened up again my whole 
sense of cockroaches. Not only that, well, there's lots of different kinds in my house. There's little ones and medium-sized ones. and They seem quite aware of me. And they're, 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 um, they seem super uh, attentive to what I'm doing. I had a, a grandmother from Newfoundland that I didn't see much. But in, when I was very young, before five years old, a few times I was dropped off at her house. And she would get up at like three in the morning on Sunday morning to make a pot roast. And I uh, didn't grow up with uh, someone cooking so I, I was very interested in that, like that she got up so early. And I would wake up and not, she wouldn't know it. I would kind of crawl into the uh, hallway and I would listen to her cooking because it was so uh, cozy and inviting, warm, a warm feeling. And I would hear her talking to the stove and the, um, pots and pans and and she called everything Johnny I don't I don't know if this is a new Newfoundland cultural thing or not but I I was just like wow like she talked to everything the broom the like hi Johnny <laughs> and I do at first I kind of went back to bed and I I was like oh my god she's a little crazy but then I would come out and I'd be like wow she she loves everything in her kitchen, all the things she uses every day. And it had a very mo like good uh, effect on me that I could see you could be friends with things that we don't often uh, learn we can have this relationship with. We re she really cared about every pot and pan. And again, some of us have that conditioning, some of us don't. But if you are at home and you see how you relate to a dish or a cup or a glass, a broom, anything, you'll get a sense of, what, are you really there? And are you really silent or are you just rushing through? So the, the sacredness of everyday objects are part of our practice on, on self-retreat. And, and just the reminder, we'll probably keep saying this, but when we're home, it, we don't even know how quiet we are because we're not seeing how we're, uh, we're, we're often getting relationships with other people on retreat, even if we don't know it. We might not like this person or like this person or get inspired by this person, all pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, and reactions. But we're not having any of that on self-retreat. Um, and we might think we're totally quiet and then go out <laughs> for a little walk and everything will be like heightened sounds or heightened sights and just to, to know that's normal. Don't think something's abnormal. That can be how it is sometimes. It's good. Oh, I don't have a... Okay. And um, I've brought, brought up probably some unusual beings, but on my self-retreat as well, there was a, a red cardinal, this last self-retreat, that would be on the telephone wire every time I went out for my early walk. And I started noticing that it would be on different wires, like the bottom one or the middle one or the top one. And uh, it would really make my day just stopping and listening and um, I miss I miss being on self retreat for those experiences for those relationships that we have the frequency with every day when I get busy I I just don't have that luxury and privilege to be able to um, stop and make eye contact and listen
Oops. This is um, Saigyo again. He had a, a Japanese word, tomo, he used a lot in his poems, which means friend. Uh, he had this very developed, this friendship with all, so many beings. And you, you hear it in his poems. He, remember, he was a hermit monk, so he spent a lot of time alone in the forest. The sound of water gets to be my sole comfort in this lonely, battered hut. In the midst of mountain storms fury, drops drip in the holes and silences. If you look at the translation, the, the word accompanying the sound of water is tomo, friend. The sound of water gets to be my sole comfort, friend. Mm. My first self-retreat after many years sitting with Sayada Upandita, I decided to do a two-week retreat at home. Uh, and I decided to sit in the kitchen. And then the refrigerator started making that loud buzzing sound that I hadn't really noticed that much, you know, on and off. And there was a lot of aversion to it. And I thought, oh, I should move to the bedroom but I thought you know, let's see, just see what happens and after some time I felt like the refrigerator became like the sound of water to Saigo in that poem it was like oh I just started to just appreciate the companionship of the sound and the refrigerator but I had to go through the aversion, right? I've, I've given examples like with the cockroach. I had to go through my discomfort. It's uh, important to know that it's easy to make friends with pleasant things. It's easy to make friends with things that are easy to make friends with. But it's not so easy with things that are difficult. And that includes our emotions, like lonely, difficult ones, like loneliness or rage. Somehow with emotions, we think we should get rid of them forever. That's not freedom. That's aversion. So I'd like to just um, go into a l little more right now about chronic pain, whether it's physical, mental, or emotional, because that is often the place that we really don't like to make friends. <laughs> it's like an understatement. And it's important to know that with a, a karmic knot or a, karm, a chronic pain over years can become a karmic knot. But there is a way in which when whatever it is that appears, the conditioning is to slam the door on it. To, to really just say, no, uh, no way. <laughs> you know, I either thought I got rid of you or I can't stand this anymore or this shouldn't be here. Uh, if we are honest often, if you've done a lot of practice, it'll be, well, I did 40 years of practice, I did 30 years of therapy, I did Tai Chi, I did, you know, whatever, and I'm still afraid of death. I still want to live longer than maybe the karma runs out or <laughs> whatever it is. It's like I, loneliness comes up and it's like we, we felt like we died from it as a kid and there's no way we're going to be with it. Or there's some pain in the body that just is too hard to be with. What, whatever it is, 
you know, that, that is chronic. Um, it tends to be something that we need a kind of delicacy of practice um, that takes many years to learn. Someone said to me today about our relationship with karmic knots. She said, when you say they are your greatest teacher, what are they teaching you? And after interviews today, I wrote pages, <laughs> pages of what they're teaching me. So I won't spend the whole talk on it, but um, we're born into a world of vast changeability, fleetingness, and this immense uh, range of pleasure and pain, including intense pain. So for me, the karmic knots, and I have a whole bunch of them, not just one, um, they're often a cluster of difficult emotion. And the first thing they taught me was about freedom, what freedom is. So everything I have said so far about silence and relationship and freedom, they've taught me that freedom isn't getting rid of them, even though, of course, when they come up, we feel like we should have gotten rid of them. That's the nature of them. If that doesn't come up when you have a car, when something comes up and you think, oh, I thought that, you know, we really don't think it should be there. Um, <laughs> that's like the nature of a karmic knot. So we have to see that we learn so much about impatience. We think we should be patient, but actually I've been very impatient with the chronic pain and all the difficult emotion. You know, I had to keep going through that and going through that and seeing that I had to understand. They forced me to understand what freedom is. It's incredible. I am so grateful to know that I don't have to get rid of them. In fact, you can't. <laughs> so the second thing they taught me was about anatta, uncontrollability. So we can talk about the process about understanding the nature of how things are. So if we notice a sound and we're aware with the non-conceptual reality of texture, vibration, or we're with a any body sensation, we notice the texture vibration, or any thought, the texture vibration, emotion, texture vibration, non-conceptual reality. If the attention can drop into that and be with it concurrently for a few seconds, we can understand the nature of things. They change, and we have no control over it. We can't always get that the insight into that doesn't isn't always accessible but once in a lifetime is transformative once in a retreat is huge we're so greedy for insight it's unbelievable because that one insight into the understanding of the nature will tell us everything about how to work with a karmic knot or chronic pain that we have so little control. And it doesn't mean, like Ajahn Shah teaches, you take responsibility, you love it, you do the best you can. I might do a lying meditation instead of a sitting because of the physical pain that I've had since 1979 that hasn't gone away, <laughs> no matter what I do, right? It's like, you know, it's just like I've learned to work with it, right? And and see that, oh, maybe I don't have enough energy right now to sit mindfully through this, but I can lying down. So that, do you see, it's like I'm not saying that you grit your teeth and endure all the time. It's much more that you have a flexibility and see when you have enough energy, mindfulness, interest, equanimity, that's the time to bring the attention inside the physical pain, the emotional pain, the mental pain, and really, 
you you learn to get that relationship of silence with uh, and it so the third thing that karmic knots have taught me is about motivation so if you bring your attention to something but the intention is to get rid of it or to want something from it that isn't mindfulness that's that's that and at what i learned from the first a lot of chronic pain in practice was that i was just reinforcing aversion i was just reinforcing the motivation to get rid of it while i was with it and it was like horrifying to me wow to get to see it and to see how slippery that get how slippery you can have the most extraordinarily free time and practice where there's this unconditional acceptance and there's no resistance to anything whatsoever you're right with there's no resist aversion comes up it's okay whatever you know chronic pain comes up it's okay you're with it you're able to explore it in one second that can change it can just go whoo and but we might not see it and we might be staying with something but actually we're staying with it because suddenly we're wanting to get rid of it but we don't even see it but eventually we'll start feeling um we've we move from contentment to discontent it can be very subtle but it's like we go from the sweetness to a bittersweet quality guess what happened the equanimity is impermanent everything's impermanent accepting that acceptance is impermanent <laughs> is a great feat and worthy of us it's freedom and i would say that karmic knots chronic pain has taught me that more than anything incredible Hmm. Okay, we we will not have time for this list of what they've taught me, but okay, next is, they've taught me how much I believe I can control, how much I believe I should be able to control, I should be able to get rid of anxiety, I should be able to get rid of this hip pain, I should, you know, if I just work hard enough, right i should be able to get rid of it and this is uh and then if you believe that that's a the view that jesse talked about it's actually a view it's an opinion that we hold that we don't always realize um there's nothing like a karmic knot or chronic pain to help you see through that one but what we tend to do is not see the view we don't see that we believe we can control and then we have doubt we have doubt in ourselves and self-hatred because of course if you believe you should be able to control and fix and manipulate of course we're going to have doubt and when we're drowning in doubt whether it's in the teaching the teacher the, the ourselves it's um it's really important to say oh there's a recipe for this you take flour salt egg whatever chocolate whatever you make a cake you bake it you take um, many lifetimes of believing we can control or one lifetime and, um, and and that not being investigated or understood and then we have something really painful that happens whether we're young or middle-aged or old and we think we should have been able to prevent that in a big scale little scale it's like and then um, this is the important place the buddha taught that when we feel overwhelmed by suffering or helpless in the face of suffering hence a karmic not is so such a good teacher because of course that we will will feel overwhelmed and helpless he taught um, that what could be accessible for us at that point if we can accept the helplessness accept the overwhelm is compassion so we might 
remember that option when something's difficult in practice. It doesn't have to seem like a karmic knot. I can tell you when the, um, my neighbor starts that um, weed whacker <laughs> and I, I'll have this aversion, you know, the purity of that aversion, you know, it's just like can be so strong at, at first. It's like he's ruining my retreat, right? It's a, it, it, but it, it's so cool. It's like, can I control the neighbor? No. But who needs compassion first? I don't think my neighbor needs compassion then. I need compassion, like, right? And I, the belief that, the belief that I should be able to control or he should know when I want him to be doing the weed whacker. You know, when you look at these things and how we can get caught, I'm giving a very simple example, um, but it could be some pain in your body. It's like, what do we do first? Do we feel like we should have gotten rid of it with our mindfulness practice in our body? Or should we um, have better concentration? And it, oh, two sittings ago, it went away when I brought my attention to it. So I should be able to do that again. Versus what's happening right now? And what's, what is the skillful means right now? Well, if we can't be mindful, if there's not enough energy, is that our fault? Is it our fault that we don't have enough energy? No. So you kind of go through, like, what, what's needed? Well, how about caring, caring about it? And the awareness does not have to be inside the pain. It doesn't have to be inside the attachment it doesn't, or wanting. It doesn't have to be inside the aversion or the um, shame or whatever, or the, the, the tightness. It doesn't have to go inside the tightness. It steps out of it. It doesn't step out so far that we're disconnected, but we're, we, we connect enough to care. And the caring about pain feels good. And this is, uh, for, you know, for the times where, never mind our own individual practice, it's like, look, we need compassion like we need water. Like we need air. I, I mentioned this, but I just want to kind of mention it again. When I go for a walk early in the morning, I do compassion for everyone. It starts with myself and ends up with the whole planet. Um, but it feels good. I think we have to remember that it feels good. And then it can open up the space then to, instead of the heart being hard or resisting, it can soften. And, and it could be that appreciating joy works for you better. I'm not trying to say oh, it's always compassion, but in terms of actual pain, compassion does tend to, uh, it doesn't fool around. It, it can go right to it. But if you can't do compassion, of course, it could be equanimity. And of course, the, you know, that teaching that equanimity and compassion are like two wings of a bird. You need both, the, the, the deep care for the pain in the world and the deep acceptance of how things are. That's remembering acceptance isn't condoning. If you accept the pain, the physical chronic pain, it doesn't mean you're condoning that you have it. It means that you have it. Very careful. We have to be very careful that when we accept something, it doesn't necessarily mean it's right. It means that it is. And it makes it much more, it makes the mind more flexible and strong to be able then to see, do we take action or not? Do I get up and lay down? for a sitting or not. Well, sometimes that's um, a very healthy, a wise action on my part. And if it's um, out, of, out of aversion and not out of compassion, it's reinforcing aversion.
And uh, lastly, <laughs> all noble things that are worthy of us mean that they tend to take time. Like, you know, for example, being free from suffering, being free from greed, hatred, and delusion is, is a very um, high bar. But it's worthy of, worthy of our effort. And anything like, maybe, maybe we're dedicated to um, helping children that have been hurt in some way this lifetime. It's like, well, it's a whole planet of children, maybe trying to um, eliminate all unnecessary suffering for children. It's a worthy endeavor, but we have to face that we might not end it all. But of course it's worthy and we, we, we learn wherever we might make a, a movement in any way on the planet, something worthy will always feel impossible. So this practice, every time you do a walking meditation formally, every time you do a sitting, teaches us how to do this. And this is very important. No matter what, if you sit and you decide to sit for an hour, 45 minutes, whatever, <laughs> what we do is we make full effort, full commitment to, to be there and be with whatever comes up without attachment to the result of the effort. Okay, I'm going to repeat the paradoxical nature of this practice, but it's, this is essential for all of us. Anything worthy of our effort, anything noble, um, will require us understanding this or we get burnt out. We don't want to do it because the little me comes in and says, it's too hard. I can't do it. It's impossible. But if we understand every time we go to sit or walk and we see that we're making full effort without <laughs> attachment to the result, that's strengthening. And that strengthens us for the big stuff and the little stuff. It's strengthening, strengthening, strengthening. Because if you're attached and you do it, every time you do it, get it guess what you're doing? You're reinforcing attachment. You're reinforcing suffering. And that's, that has nothing to do with anyone else. All You can only take care of that inside. That freedom, to, it's not that you won't have it. In fact, I'm saying, when I see that in myself, I'll say, of course, of course I don't want to be attached to that nice sitting I had yesterday, you know, <laughs> but I am. Oh, it was great, right? I, of course I want that back. I was free from suffering then. It was great. But that's not what's happening right now. It was impermanent. And if we're connected to impermanence and accept it, accept it, then we're free. Maybe I'm, this is lastly, but um, Mahasi Sayadaw had a great teaching, a great teacher from Burma. Um, his, his instruction in sitting was whatever appeared, body sensations, thoughts, emotions, sounds, you could say, this is not me, this is not I. This is not who I am. And, and the learning is that I am not my body. I am not my thoughts. I am not my emotions. 
and there's a deep silence that has nothing to do with how loud a body sensation is or how loud a sound or a loud an emotion is or intense or how quiet it's like silence has nothing to do with intensity or noise or quiet it has to do with that understanding a deep understanding of anatta this is not me this is not mine this is not who i am And it, um, sometimes there can be like an infinitesimal tweak of our practice where you just check into your body posture when you're sitting, okay, it, beginning, middle, end of the sitting, or walking, but you can see that maybe you're just trying a little too hard, but it can be so subtle. This can, It's like, or, or maybe you're pulled too far back, but it's very kinesthetic. And, Sometimes for myself, I'll just, it's like less than a millimeter. It's almost like thinner than a cat's whiskers. Very, very thin uh, shift of tweaking. And, and sometimes in these places, I'll just look for the space between a thought. Just a couple times. Just look for the space between a thought and, and kind of relax there, settle there. If you can, sometimes you can't, sometimes you can, but that there's a way in which you find that um, ease. There's a kind of ease where you're not trying too hard, not giving up, where you're understanding that um, you can kind of settle in and receive uh, a kind of invisible dhamma happening all the time. which um, I'll try to go into more my last talk. Hmm. Uh, okay, I'm ending with a, a poem by Li Po. The late, great Li Po, he was Born in 701, died. Died when? Oh, not sure. After 762, he died. This poem is called Mountain Dialogue. There's the relationship. Mountain dialogue. You ask me why I live on this green mountain. I smile, no answer. My heart serene on flowing water. Peach blossoms quietly drift away. This is another sky, another earth. No likeness to that human world below. There are times when the attention can flow with our moment-to-moment -moment sixth sense door experience. That means the heart-mind can be serene on flowing water no matter what is happening in the water. There's this silent serenity So let's just sit together for 30 seconds.
time for walking, then the metta chanting. I don't know. 